Oyez, oyez, oyez. Anyone having business before this honorable justice in the Superior Court of Justice can now shall be heard. On the seat. You may be seated. Good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Yona. Good morning. May I proceed with a witness, Yona? Yes, please. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Coates. Good morning. Dr. Coates, you're still on the oath, right? Understood. So yesterday we made good progress. And today I shall be proceeding with the remainder of your slides. So we left off at slide 45. So I shall be starting with slide 46. So please bear in mind the pace when you answer the question. So at slide 46, you refer to the adjustments to the financial arrangements. Can you take us through the bullets you have on this slide? Yes, I will. After Confederation, the financial arrangements turned to be, proved to be somewhat flexible um, as the government responded governments responded to um, the circumstances. Uh, there were, for example, in bullet one, changes to the debt allowances for the provinces. Um, we've tried, I'm sure you heard this many times in 1873, uh, the debt allowance for Quebec and Ontario was increased from 63.5 million to $73 million. Um, these were subsequently approved and made retroactive to 18, 1867. So still on slide 46, can you tell us what is the historical context behind these adjustments? Basically, in the Confederation process, the politicians, the negotiators did the best they could to anticipate circumstances, exact realities. Um, as you then go to the process of building a country, new things emerge. Um, you add Manitoba, you add British Columbia. Canada adds Prince Edward Island. Um, in the process, you negotiate new financial arrangements, um, and that changes the balance between the provinces and the federal government. Um, so in response, the government revisits these uh, financial arrangements and uh, um, shows that confederation can be somewhat flexible. You can move to slide 47. So at slide 47, you refer to a meeting of first ministers in January 1950. So can you tell us the relevance of this meeting? This slide is simply put here to, to show that the construction of confederation did not stop, that there were lots of questions about how the arrangements would be, the division of powers between federal and provincial governments. Um, 1950s after World War II, dramatic changes in Canadian financing and dramatic changes in the role of government between the 1940s, early 1950s. So this particular meeting um, of the prime minister and premiers and government officials um, was to explore whether or not they could come up with a plan to change the constitution, to change the formal relationships. Basically in this decision in 1950, they realized they couldn't, there was no agreement at this time. And, it took many more years. So moving on, your next slide, which is slide 49. So here you start by dealing with the pre-confederation treaties. And at the first bullet, you speak of the Royal Proclamation of 1763. So can you tell us what is the relevance of the Royal Proclamation of 1763? So in, in this uh, part of my testimony, I'm looking at the evolution of relations between the First Nations people and, uh, and governments, the British government and later the government of Canada. Um, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, um, very familiar quote, I'm sure, um, says that the government of Britain at this time promised the imperial uh, crown uh, 
that they would not take over indigenous lands without a treaty, essentially. It's a, a long way of, of saying exactly that. Um, this is a very important statement of the British Crown, um, designed largely to recognize um, First Nations for their al allyship, that First Nations had been very heavily involved um, uh, supporting the British in their various conflicts, sort of leading up to 1763, uh, the American Revolution and, and afterwards. Um, and so it, it is a recognition, certainly seen this way by the First Nations, um, of, of their role as allies and their role as partners. And in fact, this was the quid pro quo for First Nations for being allies of, of Britain at this, at this time. Um, subsequently, the Crown started to enter into treaties uh, with First Nations. The idea being that, that the treaties would precede um, settlement and development. Um, and the broader context, very briefly, um, is that in the United States, the treaties tended to come sort of after the settlement settlers had arrived, after the economic development occurred and conflict had sort of become the norm. So the concept in British North America um, was to try to do the opposite, to sign a treaty before major conflict actually, actually occurred. Um, so the relationships were actually very important ones. Uh, the treaties were, were highly symbolic, um, extremely important to the First Nations. These were not small deals. They were very important sort of uh, commitments. And they were designed to, I think, do three things. Um, number one, the three things other than recognize the, the alliances that had been so important for so long. First one, avoid conflict. Um, the context here is that in the American frontier was full of wars with First Nations people. And these wars were expensive. They interrupted settlement and slowed development. Britain wanted to avoid that. Um, the second one is to open up the areas for settlement and development to make it so you can proceed legally having removed indigenous claims to, to the land and ownership of the land. Um, and the third one was to provide some definition of the government's responsibility. Um, and I, I must add here that the government's priority, not the First Nations priority, was to, to keep those commitments limited. They wanted a fairly precise but a fairly limited definition of, of the government's role. And so essentially both parties um, to the treaty, the British crowns and the, and the First Nations, wanted a combination of clarity and assurance that this was going to be a sustainable relationship. And I would end here by adding one other thing, that the transition in that relationship with First Nations um, was, was really quite stunning. Um, so in the aftermath of the American Revolution, um, the, ally, the nature of alliances were very strong. These were good partners. They, they, they kept British North America safe. And this certainly was the case in the War of 1812. Um, the military needs decline after the War of 1812. And, and when you go into the 1820s, 1830s, America gets used to British North America being there. Their, their military ambitions uh, reduce. The role of indigenous people in the population changes. They're now a small minority among very many hundreds of thousands of newcomers. Um, and you see a transition of First Nations going from, from being military allies to eventually being the wards. It's a concept that sort of develops more fully after 1867 um, with the Indian Act in 1876. But their populations are declining, their relevance is declining to the newcomers, to the British. Um, and so their, their role changes from being allies to being seen as, as sort of an encumbrance uh, award of the state. So we can now move on to the next slide, slide 50. So at slide 50, you speak of the dominions, meaning the new dominion of Canada, treaty processes, and the establishment of a transcontinental nation. Can you expand on the bullets you have on this slide? 
Uh, I will. Um, the basic point here is that the treaty processes were essential to the creation of Canada and to its development into a transcontinental nation. Um, so after Confederation, uh, particularly starting in the 1870s, um, a series of treaties were negotiated, uh, particularly on the prairies, that allowed for um, the, the government's control of Indigenous lands, but also for permanent commitments by, by the government of Canada to, uh, to the Indigenous people. Um, same priorities, peaceful uh, development and peaceful settlement, um, allowing the settlers to come in uh, without, without uh, fearing sort of the attacks by Indigenous, indigenous people. Uh, the second bullet simply points out that by the 1870s, the numbers in Western Canada, after 1870, uh, Canada purchased Rupert's Land, the numbers were, were not huge, but they were thousands of people coming into uh, Indigenous territories. And the treaties were a really important part of, of uh, what one scholar referred to as clearing the plains, making, making it so the prairies were open for um, settlement for, for other peoples. Um, but my third point is to recognize something that First Nations people recognized, and that was that the world was changing in ways they could not directly control. Um, the arrival of literally hundreds of thousands of people in Southern Ontario, thousands of people in Northern Ontario, thousands in the West, um, had changed dramatically the reality of Indigenous life. Um, in ways that they were not sort of able able to control. So what happens? Um, um, they're dislocated from their lands. Uh, farm, farmers come in and chop down the trees, put in farms, um, interrupt fishing and hunting activities. Um, lifestyle changes follow dramatically from there. You can't hunt and fish and trap and move like you, you could before. Less so, less so of changes in, in the area north of Lake Superior, but really across the country, there's a whole series of transformations um, um, that occur. And the treaties were a central part of that. The, the, the treaties, and I should add, the, the honoring of the treaties were an essential part of Canada being able to develop and, and, and expand its settlement uh, without difficulty. Um, and, and it's important to sort of recognize that this process worked substantially well. Um, we do not get indigenous uprisings. We do not get attacks on settlers in anything remotely close to what happened um, in the United States and even in other, other countries. Um, First Nations uh, made commitments in the treaties to peace and to working in, in partnership with governments and, and they honored the, those uh, consistently. Um, they expected uh, support in return and uh, annuities that were signed with different treaties were a vital part of that. Uh, it was a, a way the government honored its part of, of the arrangement. Um, and it's also important to note, and I'm speaking here generally, not just in the context of, of the Robinson treaties, um, but First Nations people did uh, lobby for the full implementation of treaties and full recognition of, of their treaty rights. Um, so um, the First Nations knew how to defend their interests. And, and I'd simply end this slide by pointing out that um, Indigenous people sort of followed each other's activities very closely. They, they knew what was happening, obviously, in the adjacent areas, but they actually knew generally what was happening quite some distance away. And that shaped their demands and expectations. So a couple of questions, Dr. Coates. So, so you mentioned how post-Confederation treaties enabled the Dominion to build a transcontinental nation. But what about the pre-Confederation treaties? The pre-Confederation treaties had a similar role in, in Upper Canada, in Ontario. They, they basically cleared the way for peaceful settlement, safe development, um, and the expansion of the economy. Um, and the treaties were a way of honoring the Royal Proclamation <laughs> that I talked about before, recognizing the sort of changing needs of the Indigenous population, um, and solemnizing and making more solemn the relationship between government and Indigenous people. 
And did these pre-confederation treaties fit into that objective of the transcontinental nation? Um, the pre-confederation treaties in initially were focused on the southern part of, of uh, what's now Ontario. And, and the, this is the time well before the aspiration of a transcontinental sort of country came into existence. Um, by the time you get Robinson Superior, there's a, a growing sense, it's not uniform yet, that um, the, the United Province of the Canadas could be a foundation for the expansion uh, across the continent. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's a, a stepwise, deliberate, clear strategy, um, but it is part of what, the way in which the British uh, government expanded its presence in North America. And last question on this slide, was building a transcontinental nation one of the objective of confederation? You actually can see as early as the 1850s, some, and even before, to be honest, but you know, aspirations on the part of people in Upper Canada and, and Lower Canada to a lesser extent, to see the British North America expand into the, the empty lands of the, what they call empty lands of the Hudson's Bay Company territories. So the treaty making process itself was a very integral part of that. Um, that when they the started- The treaty process after? After Confederation, yes. Okay. Yes, very much an integral part of that whole process. Um, and we'll put the small caveat in that I'm sure everybody knows um, that British Columbia did not have treaties uh, in the same way. Um, there were reasons why that was stopped in British Columbia. But uh, um, the treaties allowed for Canada to contemplate the open open development of, of, of Western Canada in particular. And I just highlight again the fact that in the 1850s, uh, 60s, you see major conflicts in the American West um, with outbreaks of violence and, and uh, suppression of Indigenous peoples. And for very practical reasons and honourable reasons, um, Britain did not want that and could not afford it. That being the having to have battles with indigenous people. All right, I think we can move to the next slide, slide 51. So at slide 51, you deal with the Indian affairs prior to confederation. Can you go through these bullets for us? Yes. Um, I wanted to say in the first instance that, that First Nations were always keen to have access to the highest level of government possible. Um, we talked yesterday about the formal relationship with the British monarch, that that was the primary relationship between the First Nations. Uh, their agreement was not with a local official, even that local official might have introduced the documents and signed them. It was with Her Majesty and, and with the, the British Crown uh, generally. Um, we saw that in the language of the Robinson Superior Treaties, and that relationship was there. Um, and we also saw, um, I alluded to this before, in that transition after the War of 1812, um, bigger questions about how the, the British Colonial Office and UPC would actually manage its relationship um, with First Nations. 1812, it's a formal relationship handled largely through military officials. Um, there were presents, there were annual meetings, there was a lot of ceremony. Um, as time goes on, First Nations become, instead of being sort of one of the top issues for, for uh, Upper Canada and, and UPC, um, it, it slides quite dramatically in importance. Railways are more important. Immigration is more important. Rapid economic development is more important. Can you put a decade on that or do you? Sorry? Can you put a decade on that? You said you say as time goes on. Yeah, um, very good question. Um, so if you go back to the War of eighteen twelve, mm -hmm. the the battle was really for you know is is British North America going to survive, because the American threat was substantial and real. Um, by the time you get to very quickly, by the time you get to the eighteen twenties, the the military threat sort of dis disappears <laughs> quite substantially. And the need to sort of focus on the military allyship sort of recedes. You also, particularly in the 1830s, start to see a surge in immigration. And the immigration then leads to 
economic development, infrastructure development, and the occupation of indigenous lands and indigenous peoples cease to have traditional access to their to their lands for hunting and fishing purposes. Thank you. Thank you. So, if I may, yeah, um, the um, you kind of get to the eighteen fifty five eighteen sixty era. Um, the colonial office is again as part of its general desire to retreat from the day to day administration of of British North America starts giving governments officials in UPC more control and more involvement um, with indigenous affairs. And in 1860, they formally transfer uh, responsibility for, for First Nations matters uh, to the UPC authorities, um, basically making the British North America colonies, as I say here, the governments of record for relationships with First Nations. So I think we can move to the next slide, slide 52. So at slide 52, you now deal with Indian affairs at Confederation. So what I offer in, here in this slide is a reminder of how much things have changed in the stature and status of indigenous affairs within British North America. Um, 1812, War of 1812, First Nations were prominent. Um, when you look at the confederation process, you can see that several, several things stood out. Um, the obligations were, were still there. There was a discussion of who would be responsible in the, the language of the British North America Act for, for Indians and lands reserved for Indians. That was a conversation in the Quebec conference, conversation in London conference, and in the British North America Act. Um, it's also important to say that this was not a front of mind issue. Uh, in the sense that it was non-controversial. Um, the provinces were not lobbying for a role. They were not demanding that they can take over control or assume control or maintain control in the context of UPC. Um, and in fact, the UPC was more heavily involved than most of the other colonies. So sort of the situation got progressively less focused on indigenous people as you went east. So in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, there was very little emphasis by the colonial authorities on indigenous affairs. In fact, the relationship was marked by neglect and ignorance rather than in involvement. Um, so as you get to confederation, um, this is a non-controversial issue. It was recognized as a response. what would you say is a non-controversial issue? Responsibility for indigenous peoples. Thank you. Or was it seen as a non-controversial issue? Um, it was seen as an obligation but it was not a, force, a, a source of sort of contention between the provinces and the government of the new dominion. So on this slide, on the first bullet, you say that, and last sentence, you say that the architects of the BNA Act 1867 did not consult with First Nations people. Can you expand on that? This is um, an observation that from historical point of view, 40 years ago was not remarkable at all because indigenous people were not consulted on very much uh, relating to their own lives and, and, and affairs. But during the confederation process, there was no systematic effort made to sort of consult with First Nations to see whether they wanted to be provincially engaged or whether they wanted to be engaged at the dominion level. Um, I mentioned before the concept of wardship where indigenous people through the 1830s, 40s, 50s um, had been politically and administratively marginalized. We've gone a long way from high profile, highly symbolic, very important meetings of a military, strategic, even diplomatic nature before the War of 1812 and during the War of 1812 to a situation now where this was a sort of a, a minor, relatively minor responsibility of government. I don't say that in saying that that's a wonderful outcome. Um, I simply point out that's the reality. This was not something people talked about a lot. Well, let's move to slide 53. So at slide 53, you still continue on Indian affairs after Confederation. So you deal with Indian affairs after Confederation, right? Yes. So can you go through these bullets for us? Yes. Um, number one, the relationship with the Crown. Um, and the crown went from Britain to 
the dominion, um, remained very powerful. Uh, indigenous people saw these relationships uh, very seriously. Um, the British North America Act gave uh, the dominion jurisdiction over Indians and lands reserved for Indians. Um, uh, so the symbolism with a, a symbolic relationship with the crown uh, remained very, I, the phrase I use here is critical to the First Nations and accepted by the Dominion of Canada, um, in the sense that it was central to how First Nations saw their role within British North America, within Canada now, after 1867, um, and, and something that the, the Dominion of Canada just took as the norm. It was something to be, to be handled. Um, the transition that was going on uh, among Indigenous people was, was really quite uh, substantial. Um, by the time you get to the 1850s, um, many Indigenous peoples were in considerable distress. And I, I haven't talked about this much, and I'm not sure how, how relevant it is for, 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 the, for your honour. Um, disease had become a really so serious problem sort of across British North America. Um, epidemic diseases and endemic diseases. People were, were dying in very large numbers. Um, and that added to distress of having lost their traditional livelihoods. So if people have moved in to Southern Ontario um, and, and farmed, you couldn't continue your traditional activities of hunting, trapping, fishing, and, and collecting berries and things like that. Um, if you, the worst example, uh, in the Prairie West is not just the arrival of farmers onto what's now Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta, um, but the wholesale destruction of the bison herds south of the border uh, basically rendered um, the First Nations on the prairies impoverished. Um, they were, when the treaties were being signed, there were people who were starving, uh, the First Nations people who were starving. Um, what happened at this time is that, and, and again, I, something I mentioned very quickly in yesterday and is is the very limited role of government and and how government saw its responsibilities so government at that time did not have a real sense of its obligation for social welfare for example um, for making sure that people had you know food and housing and things of that sort um, but the christian churches did see that as their role and by the, government you mean uh, the governments of well before confederation UPC and after after confederation the government of Canada we still in an era of very limited government in terms of its responsibilities um, and so you end up with an interesting conversation really a series of conversations between between missionary organizations and the government about what can be done and the churches were very heavily involved and 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 at that time um sort of the, 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 the approach that sort of worked out was a sort of three-part approach. Um, number one, uh, protect Indigenous people from newcomers. Um, the consensus, particularly among the church, but also government, was that newcomer populations were harmful to Indigenous people. So you have to protect them. We get a reserve system where First Nations are physically isolated from uh, the rest of the population. Um, secondly, you have to and I put in quotation marks here, civilize. This is the language of the 19th century, civilized First Nation people. Um, that means several things. Uh, it means introducing Christianity, which the churches did um, globally, bringing Christianity to non-Christian peoples. Um, it meant introducing European values and, and, and lifestyles. And that really meant encouraging farming, a farming way of existence or industrial labor. Um, and it also involved education and the education often done by the Christian churches. So that became the, the, the general pattern, um, leading to the third element, which was assimilation. Um, and governments in UPC and governments after Confederation, the Dominion government, sort of had the view that um, Indigenous people should be assimilated into the Canadian mainstream. That if protection and civilization worked, the indigenous people would be ready to take their role within the new economy, within the new society, um, and would sort of lose their sort of indigenous roots and orientation and cultures. That was sort of the value system of, of government at the time. 
So Dr. Coates, going back on this slide at the first bullet, you say that the relationship with the First Nations had with the Crown, that relationship continued with the new dominion. Can you explain in what way that it continued with the new dominion? And before you do that, as part of that question, this relationship with the Crown, I think it is with respect to that, that you said it was critical to the First Nations and accepted by the Dominion. What's the it? Uh, the it was the relationship. The, the, for the relationship between First Nations and the government. Was critical, critical to, the to First, First Nations. Nations. For them, that was their main contact with the, the, the non-Indigenous society as a whole. For the government, my point here is that this was a, a field of marginal significance to the government more generally. The governments are not obsessing about Indigenous affairs after Confederation. Their, their concern about Indigenous affairs are more related to settlement and development. Um, there's not a, a huge amount of focus on this. Um, and uh, perhaps the best illustration of that in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, um, is that the funding for Indigenous affairs was always a matter of, um, of shortfalls. Um, there was not a lot of generosity at that time. Go yes. ahead with, so you have a question. Yes, Yona, I have a Romano. question about bullet one. Yes. So my question was that you mentioned that the First Nations had a powerful relationship with the Crown and that relationship continued with the new dominion. My question is in what way it continued? So it continued, that relationship between First Nations and, and government um, continued largely through sort of formal formal events and particularly around treaty annuity payments by government uh, by mean? government of after 1867 the dominion of canada um the first nations if you look at their the correspondence written by them or on their behalf were constantly making appeals to her majesty for attention uh for support um uh, for food um for protection um you know they saw this as as their their point of entry to, to government as a whole, um, but also to non-Indigenous society as a whole. So that relationship, which goes back to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, is, is absolutely central to Indigenous people. Um, and and it has stayed that way to the present. And on bullet three, you mentioned how it was crucial to the First Nations. So how, why was that crucial to the First Nations? First off, their world is being turned on its head. You've gone from having very, very few Europeans there, say in 1810, to the time you get to 1870, you have there being sort of Southern Ontario or Upper Canada, uh, UPC. You now have millions of people there. Um, they've been marginalized economically. They've been marginalized physically. And they've been marginalized socially. So for First Nations... The, the relationship with government um, was to use the language that's more common in Western Canada than in Upper Canada. Um, these were sacred relationships. Um, there was a, a promise that that um, um, in return for getting access to the land, that they promised that government would be their ally and we look after them sort of in the future. Um, and and I think we have much better literature about this on the prairies where what they call the spirit of the treaties um, has been very, very well documented through oral tradition of different indigenous peoples. But you see it here in Robinson as well, that indigenous people made the assumption that these treaties meant as much to the government of Britain and then the government of Canada as they meant to the First Nations. So moving on to the next slide, mm -hmm. slide. Might I, might I just say one thing at the very end of the previous one? Yeah. I, I just really wanted to point out that that um, there was no really clear idea on the part of government, if, here the government of Canada and the, and even the provincial governments, on how to proceed. But in 1876, the creation of the Indian Act uh, provided the more comprehensive definition. Their upper UPC had had a gradual civilization act earlier that started this process of, of a more comprehensive sort of um, wardship relationship between 
First Nations and the and the UPC government, the Indian Act made this into sort of a permanent fixture um, of that government and First Nation relationship. So slide 54 is the next slide. So here you deal with treaty payments at Confederation. Can you expand on this, Bullet? Yes, it's very simple. Um, before Confederation, uh, the obligation for the treaties were a responsibility uh, of, the, of the British Crown that was then sort of allocated to uh, UPC in a series of stages. It went from still being military in the 1810s and 1820s, um, very high profile, very symbolic sort of meetings to more practical meetings with the UPC authorities sort of taking over. Um, and uh, that then passed to the new Dominion of Canada in terms of being responsible for, for treaty, treaty arrangements. Um, and my next point on that uh, slide um, simply reminds us that, that um, the Robinson Treaty and the treaty payments are part of a very broad series of conversations about the federal provincial financial relationship. I just have a moment to catch up, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So next slide is slide 55. So here you speak about the transfer of responsibility for treaty payments at Confederation. So can you go through these bullets for us? Yes, yeah, so after 1867, the federal government assumes sort of that responsibility. And over time through the various versions of uh, the Indian Department, the Indian Affairs Department, the Indian branch, um, the federal government gives sort of administrative structure uh, to that process. Um, they set up Indian agencies in all different parts of, of the country. Um, 1873 established the Indian Affairs Branch as a specific sort of sort of entity. entity. Um, and the federal government took increasingly substantial roles in, um, in managing that relationship. Um, one, one that's important uh, is that in the in context of treaties, um, the federal government through the Indian Act in particular established formal processes for, for determining membership, who was going to be a status, status Indian in the, in the language of that time. Um, and the federal government exercised um, increasing control over membership, who was considered to be an Indian for the purposes of treaties and the purposes of government, uh, government relationships and whatever. Um, and I go on here on this slide to, to highlight the fact that the annuity payments um, have sort of obviously a monetary elements. There's, there's money involved. And of course, that's the, the crux of the issue at hand here. Um, but the annuity payments are, are more than that. Um, and the annuity relationship is, is an annual sort of restatement and demonstration of the fundamental relationship between First Nations and, uh, and the government of Canada, the Dominion of Canada, um, and through that, the Crown and Her Majesty. Um, so these events... Um, were highly symbolic. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have probably been to these events in, in, in modern times uh, where they still have treaty days um, where people gather and they are given their money in a in direct payment, although they now have online options if you wish to pursue that. But, but these treaty days are really significant. And, and I, I guess I would say that, that they're more significant to the First Nations than they are to the general Canadian population. Even as you get to the 1870s and 1880s, most people in Canada are not paying much attention to these treaty days or these annuity payments. It's a fairly small thing happening in the background. But for First Nations, it's, it's an annual statement of their relationship with the Crown. And, and they're quite dramatic ceremonies. Um, lots of speeches, um, lots of singing and dancing, um, lots of ceremony. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that the annuities were more than just a financial statement. They were the statement of this fundamental relationship as well. 
and on your foot. Would, would it surprise you, sir, to hear that in this trial, treaty days weren't uh, described so positively? <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me. All right. I was speaking more generally. <laughs> so, Professor Dr. Coates, so on the fourth bullet, you say that treaty payments established the floor for the federal government support to indigenous peoples and communities. Can you expand on that bullet for us? Well, I simply want to make the point there that the treaty obligation is a clear obligation and it has money attached to it. Um, but the government gave itself the right and sometimes the obligation to do more than that. Um, so, for example, if there was um, an epidemic or an outbreak of disease in a particular area, um, they would move in and provide medical assistance, bring in doctors or bring in medicines or, or things of that nature. Um, so, in other words, the, the treaty was the floor of what the government was prepared to do for First Nations people. And depending on where you were and where the circumstances were, the government's, the D Dominion government uh, would do more. Um, I don't want to exaggerate that because it's important to recognize that, that and I said this briefly before, um, 19th century Indian policy was not marked by generosity. Um, there's not a sense that government wants to jump in and do a whole bunch of things. Um, and in fact, they, the, the Dominion government went out of its way to, to limit some of its, some of its obligations. Um, and just to use a couple of really quick examples in Western Canada, when the treaties were signed, um, there was very poor management of the land allocations to First Nations. They were guaranteed a certain amount of land per person, right? So if you had 100 people, you got X amount of land. If you had 200 people, you got twice as much land. Um, we now know that, that the government undercounted quite substantially the number of Indigenous people that were eligible for these treaty land allocations. So the reserves were too small. In some cases, half the size of what they should have been. Um, in British Columbia, um, with the very full support of the BC government, um, they actually had allocated lands for Indigenous people and they took most of those lands back. Most, I shouldn't say most, much of the land back um, because they felt the First Nations weren't using it. So they said, you've got too much land and this is too important an area, so we're going to cut it back. So the treaties, and there were not real treaties in the same substantial way in British Columbia, the treaties were the base of its government's obligations, and the government could and did do other things beyond that as circumstances dictated. So now we can move to the next slide, slide 56. So here you speak of the annuity payments under the Robinson treaties. So on bullet one, I think everyone in this courtroom is familiar with the terms of the treaty. So you can proceed with the other bullets on this slide. Uh, yes, and I think most folks will know all these pieces as well. The um, treaty annuities were capitalized at $88,000 uh, to provide you know, permanent uh, permanence to, to the, the allocations that were being spent. And 1875, the annuity payments uh, were increased um, to $4 with per, per head with per person with a question of who's going to pay that sort of left sort of somewhat undetermined um, as this court knows very well. So we can move to the next slide, slide 57. So over the next few slides, you deal with efforts to achieve finality regarding debts and liabilities of the UBC. And we can turn to slide 58 where you speak about debt and liability. One of the questions that was given to me in my instructions was to look at the wet manner in which governments uh, defined debt and liabilities. Um, and I point out that there, there's no official definition of that. Um, there are different definitions of debts and liabilities, but that in this process, they basically were used more or less interchangeably. We can move to slide 59. Uh, 59 just reinforces that, that same point. Um, the correspondence includes very many references to debts and liabilities. Um, there were 
I have different ways I would define them. And some people defined them that way and some people didn't. Um, but basically in award number 10 in 1898, uh, the arbitrators agreed that the concepts would be interchangeable. We can turn to slide 60. So at slide 60, you start dealing with arbitrations that relate to the annuities. Yes. So can you go through the bullets you have here? I will, and I'll, I will do this very quickly since um, my instructions did not ask me to go into the same kind of detail you've seen with people who've already spoken and will be speaking sort of later on. Um, but uh, the 1870 award under section 142 looked at the division of, of, um, of, of debts between Ontario and Quebec and came up with a 53, um, uh, 47 sort of allocation, 53% for Ontario, 47 for, uh, uh, for Quebec. Um, and it included this paragraph 13. Excuse me, sir. I'm just going to ask Mr. Ramaya. Yes, sir. Are, are, are you putting in any new evidence here? Uh, that is not before the court. Not is there anything either. controversial here? Uh, no, this is just stating what is in the award. Right. Is that new evidence? No, that is not new. Is there anything controversial about it that you wish to add? No, nothing. Just any, commenting. Any good reason why we want to take the time on it? Uh, I think that the professor wanted to just show what these awards uh, held. Yeah. What do you want? I just want to know the context. What's the ultimate objectives of all these awards? I'm just thinking it's only a day since we have heard this. If, if you say there's something new to be added, that would be helpful. But if, if not, I'm asking you to consider whether we need it. So, Professor, on, on this slide, you deal with the arbitrations relating to annuities. So, what's the so what's the historical context of all these arbitrations? So, the historical context is the desire on the part of the Dominion and the provinces to bring a measure of finality to the Confederation process. And recognize, I said yesterday, that Canada remained a work in progress; that it wasn't finished ever, but these arbitrations were designed to sort of take a series of, of uh, very specific points sort of off the table um, and to get external event help in terms of arbitration and subsequent court hearings to, to achieve that finality. So I would simply point out that in the period from 1867 to 1900, um, there was a shared desire to, to bring some measure of, of conclusion uh, to this conversation. Um, and that involved a series of arbitrations and court proceedings. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Doctor. So moving on to the next slide, slide 61. Can I just ask then that the last point you made, sir, was was um, captured, is it, if I have it correctly, on slide 61? Yes. In the, in the bullet? That's correct. I sort of lumped the two 60 and 61 together in my answer. Okay, thank you. So at slide 61, you refer to further arbitrations and awards. And the third bullet refers to the point you were making before. That's correct. Right? Yes. So do you want to elaborate further on that third bullet? I don't think anything is more to say, just that there was a desire to wrap it up, basically. To wrap up these these debates about who pays for what and to wrap up the UPC debt conversation. And why was that important to wrap it up? Um, the somewhat broader context here is that um, by the time you get to the late 19th century to the 1890s in particular, there's a lot of debate about federal provincial relations, a lot of the provincial rights movement that Oliver Mowat was so important. Um, and federal provincial relations, particularly Ontario Canada relations, Ontario Dominion relations were becoming quite testy. Um, so the broader context here is behind this particular arbitration and process, there's there's growing irritation with with uh, that relationship and a desire to clear the clear the table. And that desire is shown through these arbitrations and discussions. That's what you mean? Yes. There's a, those are legal and administrative processes to clear clear up these problems. 
And on the next slide, slide 62, you refer to award number 15 of 1900. Great. Again, I won't ask you to interpret that award, but to situate it within that historical context for us. And award 15 sort of in, largely was designed to wrap it up. You know, you, you have a, lots of conversations, lots of debates, lots of processes, and you get to the point where you've reached basically an agreement on how to resolve this once and for all um, with the allocation of the, the $205,000 sum as sort of the final payment of, of, uh, of allocation to UPC debt um, that would uh, extinguish forever um, uh, the claims of the Dominion on the UPC. And on the third bullet, you said that the responsibility fell on the Dominion yes. after that award? Yes, correct. The responsibility to pay the annuities? For the annuities, yes. And can you expand on your fourth bullet? Well, I, I try to keep making the same point in different ways that, that they were on, it never, it took a long time to wrap everything up. There were still other issues going on at the time. So moving on to slide 63. So here you have some comments about the report of Dr. Misamo. Can you go through these bullets for us? You bet. Um, you'll know because it only happened a couple of days ago with Dr. Messamore went through the events and processes relating to annuities and other, other relationships. Um, um, we have some differences about those processes that I perhaps should, should highlight. Um, um, if I was to highlight the major one, I would say that in her report, she sort of is surprised by the process and outcome. And she's constantly looking for an explanation for why the augmentation clause wasn't developed and wasn't expanded on. Um, uh, she's surprised by that that element. I think um, that's my word, not hers. Um, I, I'm not. Uh, if you look at the way the process was unfolding, um, the Dominion of Canada um, and to lecture said the provinces were not not looking to sort of expand and have expansive definitions of Indigenous rights. They were focusing on more narrow definitions of of indigenous rights. So she does mention this, but um, um, a lot of the augmentation clause has the, the uh, graciously pleased, uh, pleased to order sort of element that gave it a series of discretion, element of discretion on the part of the government of, of Canada as to how things would actually, actually proceed. Um, and um, I think the context there is important that, that the government of Canada as it dealt with indigenous affairs in the latter decade of the 19th century in the 1890s um, was looking very much to constrain their obligations to, to governments. And then the provinces were not defending um, indigenous uh, issues very much, particularly to use extremes of the country, particularly in the Maritimes in Nova Scotia and British Columbia, um, where the local authorities were not terribly supportive at all um, of what's actually going on. Um, so, that's that's one element where uh, I think we sort of would would uh, disagree. Um, can I can I just go back? Please you say the government of Canada, um, as it dealt with Indigenous affairs, was looking to constrain their obligations to. We have governments, but is that what you're saying? To constrain First Nations. To the First Nations. To the First Nations. And the mind. provinces were not defending. Yes. Thank you. And sorry. I, no, that, that's a very good clarification. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. Um, I think it's just important to know that that First Nations did not have very many defenders in this process. They, the, the provincial governments were not standing up for Indigenous uh, folks in any systematic way. Um, I'm not just talking about Ontario, but more generally across across the country. Um, and highlighting something I said before, um, the socioeconomic circumstances of Indigenous people uh, continue to be very troubled uh, in terms of their health, their poverty. Um, their economic activity, right? So uh, there was not a lot of optimism in Canada about, uh, about Indigenous affairs. Um, and when it showed up, it showed up in fairly aggressive action like the residential schools, you know, sort of rapid civilization uh, efforts that were made, particularly after the 1880s. 
Um, also, on the third bullet, if I could, um, sort of surprised several times that Dr. Messamore sort of refers to things as matters of justice. Um, and it's just an interesting series of sort of value statements that she enters in from time to time. Um, justice would dictate that. This is the, the right way that things would actually go. Um, you know, and it seems that in my, my reading of this is that that's, that that's an important sort of moral judgment and something that we could, could debate at great length. Um, the issue for me wasn't sort of whether this was all handled properly. There's many aspects of Indigenous affairs that were not handled properly, not just annuities or treaties or other things at all. Um, and that, that uh, I think that the that her report sometimes goes away from the historical situation into sort of telling us what what she thinks morally about about the way these things actually actually evolved, um, and um, we end up sort of hearing more what she hoped would happen. There's fairly long conversations about what she thought they should have done um, in the conversation around. Um, uh, around the 1901 arbitration and arbitration 15 um, she spoke at quite some length about you know but they didn't talk about augment augmentation true they didn't talk about augmentation and that just not the least bit surprising you know this is this is just how governments at that time dealt with indigenous affairs they were to you, you when you say that's not surprising that's to not, me not surprising to me it's not a continuation of your comment on what dr messmore no. said no, okay. It's not surprising to me that that happened. Correct. So, um, I, I guess uh, my you, sorry, I interrupted you. You were going to say why it was not surprising to you. Uh, I thought. <laughs> well, not surprising to me uh, for several reasons. Um, one is is that the management of Indigenous affairs after Confederation was was messy, was full of many many compromises between federal and provincial governments. Um, marked as much by the reluctance of the government to um, implement all of its promises. Um, and in this regard, it's not a surprise. It's, that's just the nature of Indigenous affairs sort of, sort of at this time. Um, i use one example, if I might. Uh, in 18, Treaty 1 and Treaty 2 in the 1870s, they developed what were called the outside promises. So when the treaties were negotiated, um, the government brought what they thought was an appropriate treaty and said, here's the agreement. And the First Nation said, no, that's, that's not an appropriate agreement. We want more. So they negotiated on the spot what they called outside promises that included education, um, included uh, more farm implements and farm instruction and things like that. Um, and so the First Nation signed the treaty, 18, Treaty 1, Treaty 2, on the basis of the text and the outside promises. Well, the outside promises were not implemented for quite some time. And First Nations had to lobby to have them added uh, back in. So the, the process here was not one of looking how you could maximize your relationship with First Nations or respond to all of the things. It was minimal approach. You know, what, what do we have to do to get through? Um, and that was certainly the case of the federal government and certainly the case of the Ontario government. And sir, when you say their approach, are you talking about these post-confederation discussions? Very much the post-confederation discussions. Right. Um, and, and also the discussions with, in this case, with Ontario on these issues, um, with other provinces on, on Indigenous issues as well, um, and also in their response to a lot of um, First Nations representations. And I would simply make the point that we all, I think everybody knows that, that First Nations continued to, to press for sort of more attention to their rights um, and, and, their, and, their, and the government's responsibilities um, on a consistent basis over time. And so I was just trying to tie back your comments. You said they took a, a minimal approach. Um, not, let me just see. You said, so the process here was not one of looking at how you maximize your relationship or respond to all of these things. It was a minimal approach. And I asked you, were you talking about the post-Confederation discussions? And is this a 
a tie back to your views on what happened through the series of arbitrations? The arbitrations plus all the other Indigenous policies that were that were sort of underway. Um, it sort of shows up in, in many, many aspects, uh, many aspects for sure. So Dr. Cruz, do you have any further comments about bullet number three, the comment that you quote from Dr. Mesimo on slide 63? Well, it just was, it, it's more the, the, the language that's used around this, because it seems to me that there was a very rigorous process a very rigorous technical process used to figure out what the different responsibilities were. And that went through arbitrations, it went through Supreme Court in some instances, it went through the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Um, and so the process actually had many opportunities for all governments, all sides, except First Nations, to sort of make their representations. Um, and so um, when she says that justice would dictate these kinds of things, well, we had a a judicial process, an arbitration process that actually provided a resolution. So moving on on your next slide, slide 64. So you further, you continue further with your comments on the report of Dr. Mesimo. Yes. So can you take us through what comments you have? Yeah, I, I would start by, by saying several things um, that um, and this is not something directly on her report, but just sort of fits into more where I where I started to view things in somewhat some some difference, um, is that the federal government did not treat Ontario as a as a partner in the management of First Nations affairs. Um, this was not a sort of a joint federal provincial approach to Indigenous peoples. The constitutional obligations sat with the Dominion, um, and the province of Albert of Ontario and the, all the other provinces were very comfortable with this. Um, and I think that's that's kind of important important to know, um, and it's important to know that that this sort of also applies across the country as a whole. And um, use the example again from well, in this instance from British Columbia, when British Columbia joined Confederation, um, the act, the Articles of of Union with with British Columbia um, basically said that the federal government and BC agreed that they would deal as, favor as favorably as, as they had in the past with indigenous rights. Um, they hadn't dealt favorably in the past. And British Columbia for more than a century used that article as a reason for doing next to nothing, right? So the provinces were often looking not to expand their roles and the federal government um, was, was uh, constrained in this regard as well. Um, I was a bit puzzled at different times in Dr. Mesimore's report where she does say, uh, as I would say, um, about myself, that she lacks the legal ex expertise to make technical judgments, but she nonetheless doesn't have much problem disagreeing with the Supreme Court of Canada and JCPC on fairly complex constitutional and legal matters. So she went down lines that I would probably not uh, go down. Um, I would also say that I was surprised um, by the, the counterfactual speculations um, those are are very interesting sort of thing to include in a report of this nature, um, because you're looking at historical circumstances and trying to figure out why things happened in the way they did. Um, counterfactual history um, is not one that is, it's one used often by commentators. It's one used sometimes as a sort of a reflection on what might have been, um, but there actually is a field of counterfactual history where, where people decide and they look very carefully at a particular circumstance to, um, to, to see if, if, if a different history might, a different outcome might have, might have been possible. Um, she uses the example in the, if, if the crown lads had been held by the federal government and if that would have resulted, I use that quote there, um, been easier to sort of figure out the annuity payments and that sort of thing. Um, that's just such an interesting choice because you, my, my, not my counterfactual one, but my, the, the research would suggest you wouldn't have had confederation if the crown had, in, if the dominion had insisted on, or if the, uh, the dominion government had been granted control of public lands. Um, it, it was an option, something that Alexander Galt talked about. Um, so it wasn't as though it was off, it, it wasn't never discussed. It was discussed and soundly rejected by the provinces. 
So you're, you're, you're reflecting on a possibility that was not an historical possibility. It wasn't a likely thing to have happened at that particular time. So I'm a bit concerned about, about that. Um, and, and I think the same sort of thing, she talks about the capitalization of annuities. Um, and if she's going to reflect, as she does in the sort of a counterfactual way about, well, oh, we could have done this differently and we, we could have had a, a sort of a different outcome. Um, I would have thought that she would have talked much more. And she does mention this in passing uh, in her report at several times. Um, about what was actually going on with the indigenous populations, where the indigenous populations were at best stagnant, in many instances falling, that they didn't talk about the growing debt because, or the growing annuity payments, because there was the great expectation there wouldn't be, um, that you would actually have indigenous people move away from their communities, that later on they would be enfranchised and give up their, their Indian status, um, and so that the annuities would would not um, um, would not continue, would not grow. So she's focused on the question of growth because that's a contemporary question. But at the time, uh, it, it doesn't really um, say very much about about what the politicians were thinking about and what the civil servants were were thinking about uh, so much. Um, uh, these were really hard times uh, for Indigenous people. Um, and on a national scale, the indigenous population um, declined very sharply from 1900 till about 1920. It varies a lot by region, but the population dropped precipitously over that period of time. Smallpox, measles, influenza, uh, whooping cough, um, all these diseases that came in and all the dislocations that actually happened. Um, so she again is sort of surprised by the lack of attention to the augmentation clause. Um, and and I, I'm not surprised, partly for the simple reason that there is that, that grace element. It is up to the government to decide if it wishes to pay you know, the annuity um, in the phrase of the time, but also because the country, to the degree the country was thinking about First Nations issues, they were primarily focused on whether they would actually survive as peoples, whether they would physically disappear and die over a period of time. Um, so it, it's just a different approach uh, that we have to that one, I think. So that's the point you make on the third bullet? Yes. That historians uh, are not comfortable taking a counterfactual reasoning? Um, they often do it as sort of a, the last comment they make sort of in, a, in an article is, wouldn't the history be different if? Um, but there is a field of counterfactual history that's got very sort of precise methodological sort of expectations that you have to look at, at something and say, I'll use a very strange example that has nothing to do with Canada. Um, there's a lot of counterfactual history being written about the Second World War. Um, what if Nazi Germany before, when Nazi Germany launched its attack against Russia, just before they decided to launch an attack toward Greece. And that took a lot of resources, a lot of, a lot of soldiers, a lot of equipment away. So there are some historians who've said, we know there are these two strategies. And, and one of them was put everything into Russia. And the other one was let's get rid of Greece first and then go to Russia. So the counterfactual historians in a very, very technical, very precise way, look at that kind of process to see whether in fact it, it, how it might have changed the world. And, and that kind of, it, it, is a, it, there's counterfactual speculation, there's counterfactual history. So there actually is a, it's a small field, but a field of people who actually go and do that very, very systematically. Thank you, doctor. So moving on. So at your next slide, you deal with a summary of the key points. So can you quickly tell us what are the key points you find that? And that's slide 65. Yes, Shona. Thank Sorry you. 65 and 66. And, and I promise not to do it quickly <laughs> in the sense of speaking too fast, I hope. Yeah, <laughs> um, so the, the, Rob, the key points are these, that the Robinson Superior Treaty um, sought to remove impediments to settlement and development. Uh, it sought to provide a measure of compensation to First Nations in return for their lands. Um, 
um, and obviously it included an augmentation clause um, that you all know about very, very well. Um, my, my testimony has focused a lot on the origins for confederation. And, and one of the things I would say is that it's important to remember that, that the Dominion of Canada was not a, a, an ideological creation. It was not a rising up of the people uh, across British North America to create a new, a new nation um, in a way that we sort of saw with the United States, so the sort of rising up against British authority. Um, it was essentially a practical, pragmatic um, um, agreement constructed between a series of colonies that were united in their commitment to the British system, British tradition, British parliament, um, but actually had very little to do with each other. So it was a very practical business-like you know, sort of deal from the, from the process. Um, and it's important to me to emphasize that, that practicality. Um, the Maritimes almost didn't join. Um, you know, they, they came very, very close to sort of pulling out of, of confederation. Um, and, and it took a long time to get all the other pieces in. In fact, Newfoundland joined in uh, 1949. So it, it was not an obvious, easy sort of process. It was very practical and very pragmatic. Could you help me with that? You gave us many examples of this practical, pragmatic approach to confederation, and you distinguished it from an ideological approach, and you referenced the uh, reluctance of the maritime provinces. H how do you um, say to the court that that is something to take into consideration in understanding what ultimately happened either at the arbitrations or in the agreements? Um, I guess my observation would be that this was, as I say, a very practical arrangement. Um, because of that, it was full of compromise, full of less than ideal, less than perfect sort of resolutions. It was not based on high, easily articulated principles, other than the connection to the British crown and the and British tradition. And, and both of those are very important. Um, but the Confederation was messy in the first instance, messy post-Confederation, and quite frankly, messy till the present. Um, I don't mean that to say Canada's without accomplishment. It's one of the greatest countries the world's ever seen. So, I, you know, but it was a messy process. And, and that you, you cannot expect through any sort of sub-branch of that process to see you know, attention to, to high principles on a regular basis, on a systematic basis, endless compromises, um, things that don't make an awful lot of sense. You know, um, I use the example because it's a very strange one of when Manitoba joined, um, they forced uh, the people of Red River, forced the government to negotiate a province, provincial relationship, but they made it tiny. Manitoba was a postage stamp province. It only went from basically from Winnipeg to Brandon. It was a very tiny sort of place. They didn't, they could have made it much larger and you could have made it a formidable presence in the in confederation. So confederation is, is a, when I say, I also said before, carefully constructed. It, it's a carefully constructed series of compromises. Johnny McDonald did not get what he wanted. Alexander Galt did not get what he wanted. And Joseph Howe did not get what he wanted or Charles Tupper from Nova Scotia. Nobody got the whole package. And, and in ca case after case after case, there were all of these concessions that people had to make along the way. And I just think it's important to, for us in all of our relating to Indigenous peoples and, and, and Canadian history to sort of keep that in mind, that it wasn't pure and it wasn't pristine and it wasn't crafted around sort of ideological commitments. And do you say that the final resolution with respect to the annuities was one of these many compromises or that I, I'm just not sure what you're saying about it or that it is a good example that um, high ideological uh, aspirations weren't uh, part of the discussion when it came to annuities. I, I think it's quite clear the latter part that you've mentioned that there's not the, the high principles. 
you know, if there were, you would have had these arbitration places saying, and what do we do about the augmentation clause? It would have been a central piece in the conversation. But what you're doing is you look at the final resolution, 1900 resolution. It is the outgrowth of a step-by-step -step series of things that use the Supreme Court, which is a new creation, uses JCPC to, for adjudication, um, appeals from Ontario, appeals from Quebec, appeals from the government of Canada. It's a, it's a messy process, right? And so it doesn't sort of follow very logically and systematically through. And in that context, it fits very much the way you've, the way you've summarized it, um, that it is a part of a, of a nation built on compromise. Um, and it's less than perfect. Um, less I, than... I'm only taking your words. Yes, I understand. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, no, no, but you were finishing. It's a nation built on compromise and... Well, and, and the rest of Canadian history has been about dealing with the compromises. Okay. And if I can put it that way, that, that there's so many different parts to this that you compromise with the Maritimes, you compromise with British Columbia, you compromise with Ontario. Um, and the rest of Canadian history has been sort of how do we get around those things that we decided back then? Um, so in one sense, the arbitration process as it worked um, um, showed that Confederation worked, that the structures of the British North America actually worked quite practically. Um, First Nations were not part of those arbitrations. They were not there at the table. They were not asked for their opinion. So that too is part of the reality of Canada in the late 19th century. Thank you. So you would say, Professor, that these arbitrations form part of that compromise? Uh, very much, very much. I mean, a part of a compromise with a formal structure attached to it, right? So the arbitration process was part of the compromise. So we cannot, on the basis of philosophy or ideology or consent, um, agree to an obvious resolution. What we can agree to is arbitration to put this in the hands of somebody else who will decide it for us which the whole process of going through using an arbitration is a good example of, of a commitment to compromise. And you would tie this arbitration process back to confederation? Uh, absolutely. So moving on to slide 66. So here I'm summarizing my, my contributions. Um, I simply say that um, Finances, the questions of debt and finances generally, were central to the creation of Canada, central to the Confederation process, central to the drafting of the British North America Act. That everything we just talked about in terms of compromise and balancing federal provincial interests show up in that those financial arrangements, um, and also the the application of those financial arrangements. So. Even after the deal was done, there were still amendments to that deal as time sort of sort of passed on. Um, it's quite clear that um, uh, I hope I made the point that the UPC wanted to be relieved of its financial debts, but also the Nova Scotia and New Brunswick didn't wish to take them on. They didn't want to be saddled with those debts uh, in a direct sort of way. Um, a second bullet here uh, is that First Nations Affairs generally and matters relating to treaties um, did not figure prominently in the confederation process. In one sense, I, I'm not sorry, I'm contradicting myself, but contradicting sort of these different elements in the process. The British government and the Canadian government took their obligations under the Royal Proclamation and under treaties to be solemn legal obligations. Um, they just weren't part of the real ongoing discussion in, in Canada as a whole. It wasn't something that Canadians outside the political process uh, took much responsibility for. It didn't show up very often in, in uh, you know, political debates or in elections and things of, and things of that sort. Um, what happens really um, is this sort of decline of Indigenous peoples into irrelevance. Um, and again, I say that with sorrow. It's a, it's a, they went from 18, 1812 when they were First Nations were fundamental to the survival of British North America. And then you get to the 1890s and they've largely pushed to the, to the margins of the Canadian political process. And the last slide, slide 67. 
Yeah, the, la the point here is that under under the British North America Act and all the processes leading up to that, it was just assumed that the Dominion of Canada would res would take responsibility for First Nations affairs. That that was just integral part to that whole process. Um, I think it's important to point out that that's how First Nations expected this to operate. Um, to use the best example would be British Columbia, where um, in the 1870s, uh, the First Nations were very reluctant to deal with the province of British Columbia. They wanted to deal with the crown and they wanted to deal with the monarch. And in fact, they were making appeals directly to London to try to get attention to their rights, right? So for First Nations, you know, it, they wanted to deal with the highest level of government they possibly could. Any further comments, doctor? I would just simply point out that that continues to the present. You know, that you still see references to, all the time, references to in First Nations relationship with the crown, um, relationships with, uh, um, with the king, um, previously with the queen. Um, that, and I just, you, I, I know in this group, you don't need to worry about this, but sometimes Canadians trivialize that. And they look and say, well, this is just all words. It doesn't mean very much. Well, on the First Nations side, that actually means a lot. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Doctor. So these are all my qu the questions I had for you. You know, I reached the end of my examination in chief. So at this stage, I'll ask for the trial demonstrative to be marked as the next numbered exhibit. Suppose I believe it's 85. Any issues? Thank you. Exhibit 85 then will be the demonstratives of Professor Coates. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Coates, these were all my questions. So my colleagues for my friends for Canada and for the plaintiffs will be asking you questions in cross-examination. Thank you. I am prepared to start now, although it is very close to the time we would take a break. So maybe it might be a good time for just a short break, 15 minutes or whatever the reporter feels is necessary. Right. Why don't we take the morning break then? All right. Professor Coates, I'm Glynis Evans, counsel for the Attorney General of Canada. I'd like to start with your errata. You identified for us that where you have award 11 in two places on page 66 in your report should have been award 10. Is that right? Correct. And you also noted that on page 55 of your report, when you quote the Quebec resolutions, you had the numbers wrong and you gave us the new numbers for those resolutions. Is that right? Correct. Are there any other errors in your report that you would like to correct? Uh, not that I can remember right now. Okay, thank you. I'd like to start by asking you about the conferences leading to confederation. And here we'll start at page 22 of your report. So on page 22 of your report, well, my friend brings it up on the screen. I'll, I'll read from the beginning of that page. The conversations between British North American political leaders in Charlottetown and Quebec City in 1864 winnowed the many and competing ideas down to an acceptable compromise. Two colonies, Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island, stepped away from the negotiations and were not involved when the Quebec resolutions were adopted. Although both, particularly through their British appointed governors, remain interested in the union process. And then I'd also like to turn to page 30 of your report, where in the middle of the page, 
in the, the first full paragraph there, probably about four lines down, you say, as stated, a little bit further down, as stated, Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island did not remain in the Confederation discussions after initial involvement in the Charlottetown Conference in 1864. So I take it from those passages that it's your evidence that Newfoundland attended at the Charlottetown Conference in 1864, but then didn't attend at the Quebec Conference. Is that your evidence? Yeah, it's a mistake on my part. Um, Newfoundland did not participate in the in the Charlottetown Conference, and they sent observers to the to the uh, Quebec Conference. All right. So, and what about Charlottetown? Was Charlottetown in attendance at the Quebec Conference? You've told us that they weren't. Prince Edward Island? Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, Prince, Prince Edward Island did send delegates, but they, they didn't stay to, they weren't involved with the final decisions. All right. Can we put up on the screen then um, the report from the Quebec Conference, the resolutions? It's in the um, joint book of documents marked at tab 1987, and my colleague has brought it up on the screen. Can we scroll to the top of that document, please? This is a report of resolutions adopted at a conference of delegates from the provinces of Canada, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick, and the colonies of Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island, held at the city of Quebec, 10th October, 1864, as the basis of a proposed confederation of those provinces and colonies. And I'd like to just take a look at a few of those resolutions. Let's start with number 17, for example. There's a number of them that suggest that Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island had not actually stepped away from the discussions at this point. We see coming out of the Quebec resolutions, a, a proposal for representation in the House of Commons at resolution 17. And just for example, let's go to resolution 63. scroll down probably here we go in the middle of the page this is we've heard this paragraph before uh, in the context of the financial arrangements that were discussed at the Quebec conference Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island not having incurred debts etc cetera, etc cetera. so looking at these Quebec resolutions does this change your your recollection about the extent to which Prince Edward Island for example was involved in the Quebec conference yes I should have been clear that they were sort of not involved subsequent to the Quebec, Quebec conference. All right. So there's actually a correction required then to your report yes. at pages 22 and 30. Yes. With respect to both Newfoundland and, and Prince Edward Island's Correct. attendance at both the Charlottetown conference and the Quebec conference. Correct. Thank you. Another issue at, coming out of those conferences at page 24 of your report Maybe we can put that up on the screen as well. So at 24 of your report in the second paragraph, you say in the last stages of the negotiations in London, critical issues emerged, the role of Roman Catholic education, financial strategies for dealing with colonial debt, plans for the incorporation of Hudson's Bay Company territories, et cetera. Financial strategies for dealing with colonial debt, what were the critical issues that emerged at the London conference then? The ones that have been discussed at the, at the, at the Quebec conference about the, the um, relative um, allocation of debt between the different jurisdictions. So in fact, these weren't issues that had emerged, but rather issues that had already been dealt with at the Quebec conferences. They were being finalized in the London one, yes. All right, thank you. You go on to say, as another critical issue emerging, British support for a transcontinental railway. You see that? Yes. What are you referring to when you talk about the transcontinental railway? Well, in the, in the early stage, 
Um, the conversation was about the intercolonial railway from basically from um, New Nova Scotia into Upper Canada. Um, but there were people talking at that time about the idea of incorporating British Columbia at some point, although they were not involved in this in these meetings themselves. And in fact, the intercolonial railway made its way into the BNA Act, it did. isn't that right? It did. But there's no mention of the transcontinental railway. Not in that same way. Because at this point, British Columbia wasn't so part of this. But British Columbia, of course, wasn't involved in these confederation discussions. Isn't that right? That's correct. So the issue of the transcontinental railway wasn't really a, in the minds of the parties of confederation until British Columbia joined the discussion. It was in the minds of some of the proponents even earlier than that. Um, but in terms of the technical detail, you're correct. So did you intend to say transcontinental railway here, or would it be better to have said intercolonial railway? Intercolonial, for sure. All right, thank you. I'd like to turn to discussion of section 142 of the BNA Act. And for that, let's go to page 40 of your report. The last paragraph of page 40, you say, anticipating technical and even political disputes arising from the Confederation arrangements, the founders established an appropriate arbitration and appeal process. This was a standard and crucial element in any major political agreement and was fundamental to the financial accord. To this end, the parties established arrangements for the adjudication of disputes and the arbitration of financial arrangements. Section 142 of the British North America Act outlined the process to be used for dealing with such matters, providing a clear review process designed to remove highly contentious and complex issues from the political process. So here you describe, as I understand it, section 142, of the BNA Act as providing for an appeal process and a review process. Is that correct? That's what I said, but yes. And are you referring exclusively to Section 142 of the BNA Act when you describe it this way? I meant to, but in fact, I was referring in more generally to what actually happened in practice. All right. So I suggest to you that Section 142 didn't create an appeal process or a review process. It was actually a one-time arbitration to allocate the assets and debts of the United Province of Canada between Ontario and Quebec. Would you agree with me? I would agree. All right. So the parties were not going to keep going back to the Section 142 arbitrators to resolve disputes. Isn't that right? That's correct. All right. Let's go to slide 35 of your presentation. Thank you. So here you say on slide 35, recognizing the complexity of identifying the apportionment of debts between Ontario and Quebec and between those provinces and the Dominion of Canada, a dispute resolution system was established under section 142 of the BNA Act. In fact, section 142 of the BNA Act did not involve any apportionment of debt between the provinces and the Dominion of Canada, did it? No, as you're correct, it's between the provinces, the two provinces of, of former members of the UBC. All right, so that's another error then, is that right? Correct. All right. In fact, the only involvement that the Dominion had under section 142 was that they would be appointing the third arbitrator, is that right? Correct. All right, thank you. And while we're on slide 35, the second bullet point 
you say the provincial governments sought to limit their liabilities and to have the arrangements as outlined in the Confederation Agreement considered as a final settlement. Would it be fair to say that the Dominion government also sought to limit its liabilities? Correct. And of course, the primary way in which the Dominion sought to limit its liabilities was by setting the debt allowances. Is that right? Correct. So let's talk about those debt allowances. First, I'd like to turn to page four of your report. And at the top of the page, probably about four lines down, I'm going to quote, through the years leading up to Confederation, starting with the resolutions that emerged from the Quebec Conference in 1864, proponents of union articulated a plan to have the planned central government assume fixed portions of existing colonial slash provincial debt. This understanding was defined in quite precise terms as early as the Quebec Conference of 1864. And I'd then also like to look at how you describe this at page 59 of your report. So at page 59 in the first full paragraph, right about the middle of the page, I'm starting with for their part. Have you got it there? I do. For their part, the provinces wanted assurance that most of their debt to the established limit would be assumed by the government of Canada, which held much of the Dominion's actual and potential revenue producing power. From their side, the nascent government of Canada, dominated by politicians who knew the old colonial system extremely well, wanted to ensure that their commitment to cover the colonial debts was not open-ended and had precise limits. And that's your evidence? Yes. All right. So is this desire for precise limits what motivated the debt allowances? I believe so, yes. And any debt beyond those allowances would be excess debt for which Ontario and Quebec would be liable to the Dominion and be required to pay interest at 5%. Is that correct? Correct. So let's look at slide 30, 33, I'm sorry, 33 of your report. Behind tab six. And here I'm looking at the first bullet point, which is straight from a sentence on page 50 of your report. Here you say, for confederation to be acceptable politically, the new provinces of Ontario and Quebec had to be reassured that existing debt would be dealt with and that the jurisdictions would not be saddled with ongoing fiscal liabilities. When you say the existing debt had to be dealt with, you don't mean that it had to be wiped clean, do you? No, it had to be determined one way or the other the, the, within the debt allowance or considered as excess debt. So it was acknowledged that there would be excess debt. Is that right? It was acknowledged it was possible, yes. And, and certainly was, knew. Sorry, did you want to finish? Just simply say certainly was the case in UPC. So it was, it was expected with respect to the United Province of Canada that there would be excess debt. Is that right? Yes. And that was the whole purpose of Section 112 of the BNA Act. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Still on that same slide, you go on in that sentence to say that the jurisdictions, the new provinces wanted to be reassured that the jurisdictions would not be saddled with ongoing fiscal liabilities. I presume this includes the Dominion as well as one of the jurisdictions involved? Yes, with the sort of odd comment that the Dominion didn't exist before 1867, so it existed conceptually. 
But for confederation to be acceptable politically, the dominion could not be saddled with ongoing fiscal liabilities. There had to be some kind of balance. Is that right? A resolution, yes. Let's go to slide 34. I want to start with the third bullet point on the page. Placing an upper limit on the debt, bracket, the debt limit was subsequently increased, bracket, which was divided and assigned to the provinces of Quebec and Ontario, sought to provide a significant balance between the former UPC and the two maritime colonies. So when you talk about placing an upper limit on the debt, are you talking about the debt allowance? Yes. So which was at 1.62.5 million and later increased to about 73 million? Correct, in both right. cases. So you mentioned that placing an upper limit on the debt, which was divided and assigned to the provinces. Are you suggesting that the 62.5 million was divided and assigned to Ontario and Quebec? It was the debt of UPC divided between the two jurisdictions. And it was the excess debt that was yes. divided between them. Yes. Because the 52.5 million had in fact been assumed by, essentially forgiven by the Dominion. Isn't that right? Correct. Okay. And there was no limit on the excess debt. Isn't that right? No. No, it's not right? No, no. <laughs> that is correct. It's correct. There was no limit on the on the excess debt. The excess debt could could have could have continued to grow, in fact. Isn't that right? Yes. Thank you. While we're on slide 34, let's go jump up to the first bullet point. Here you note the key federal powers are enumerated in section 91 of the BNA Act, 1867. And the areas in which provinces, quote, may exclusively make laws, close quote, are outlined in section 92. So both sections 91 and 92 list items for which each government has legislative authority. Would you agree with me on that? Correct. That is the power to make laws in respect of the enumerated items. Is that right? Correct. So because the federal government has the exclusive power to make laws regarding Indians and lands reserved for Indians, this doesn't mean that the province of Ontario has no responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis Indigenous people. Isn't that right? They were not clearly articulated. Not clearly articulated in the Constitution? In the Constitution, yes. But the fact that the federal government has exclusive legislative authority does not mean that the province has no authority with respect to dealings with Indigenous people. Provinces could be involved, and they were very differential in terms of how the different provinces got involved. And in practice, the province of Ontario has a lot of responsibilities with respect to Indigenous peoples within the province of Ontario. Wouldn't you agree? Are you talking over the long history of time? Or I'm talking, talking specifically in the Confederation era? Over, over the history of, of Canada since Confederation, since, the, since uh, Ontario came into being in 1867. Yeah, the provinces have gotten involved quite a bit. For example, the province would have an obligation to consult with Indigenous groups where resource, resource projects, for example, in the province of Ontario might impinge on or affect lands over which Indigenous groups claim Aboriginal title. Is that right? That particularly after uh, the decisions in 2004, uh, the Haida and Taku decisions on duty to consult and accommodate. And the province of Ontario also would have responsibility to Indigenous peoples to ensure that their treaty rights to hunting and fishing would be respected within the province of Ontario. Because they have such a clear role in terms of management of the natural resources, um, they have a role to play. Thank you. Let's move to slide 36. On slide 36, you've reproduced section 111 of the BNA Act, which we've dealt with a number of times already. 
the only part I wanted to draw to the court's attention and to your attention is that Canada shall be liable for the debts and liabilities of each province existing at the union. So is it correct to say then that any certainty or finality, and here I'm looking actually, I should, I should move ahead to your second bullet point on that slide. First, we've got the quote from section 111. The second bullet point says that section 111 and the other sections of that part of the BNA Act were aimed to provide a measure of certainty and finality to the parties to the Confederation Agreement. And I wanted to ask you, is it correct to say that certainty and finality is only with respect to debts existing at the union? Is that right? Correct. And in fact, you say that yourself on slide 61, where in the last bullet point of slide 61, You say the collective effort devoted to discussions between 1867 and 1900 in particular demonstrated a shared desire to provide a measure of finality to the matter of the UPC's financial obligations as they existed at the time of Confederation. Is that right? Correct. And so, well, if any. You, just let me catch up for a moment, please. At slide 61. We moved from slide 36 to slide 60. Got it. Thank you. Go ahead. So if any new debt arose after the union, that is after 1867, but arising out of some arrangement prior to the union, there couldn't be certainty or finality with respect to that, could there be? Correct. And in fact, you tell us in your slides that before I'll take you to it, slide 41. You acknowledge that the Confederation deal, I'm looking at the last bullet point on slide 41. The Confederation deal, while followed in most respects in subsequent generations, remains somewhat open on federal provincial financial terms. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. All right, I'd like to look at slide 52. Here you say in your second bullet point that pursuant to resolution 29 of the Quebec resolutions, which I think we can agree ultimately resulted in section 91 of the BNA Act, responsibility for indigenous peoples was assigned to the proposed government of Canada, which was to assume responsibility for representing the crown in its relations with first nations. Are you suggesting that it was the government of Canada, the Dominion only, that was responsible for representing the Crown in the Crown's relations with First Nations? The, the federal Crown. There's a provincial Crown as well. So the provincial Crown also had responsibility then in representing the Crown in relations with First Nations. Isn't yes. that right? Sorry, I'm not sure I... The original question, when are you saying it was the only the federal crown who had responsibility it was only the dominion who had re who was responsible for representing the crown yeah, the dominion government and added and the provincial crown as well yes okay That's great. so let's look at slide 53 In the third bullet point, you say, the symbolism of the crown, now represented by the Dominion of Canada, was crucial to First Nations 
and was accepted by the Dominion of Canada. Now, of course, the province of Ontario also assumes the symbolism of the crown, does it not? Yes, but I'm referring here specifically in the relations with First Nations. So in this particular litigation, one of the defendants is His Majesty the King in right of the province of Ontario. Right. Is that not an example of the province of Ontario representing the crown and I taking hope, on the symbolism of the crown? I hope you don't mind if I don't follow the legal part of this because that's not my, my background, but I'm referring here particularly to the symbolic relationships that the First Nations have with, with uh, Her Majesty, His Majesty. That was my reference to the symbolism part. So you've told us a few times that, and in fact, why don't we turn it up, that, that um, the first, on slide 66, because we're almost there, let's go to slide 66. The last bullet point on slide 66, you tell us that the new national government assumed responsibility for the management of First Nations affairs, which coincided with the First Nations expectations that they would work with the highest order of government. You haven't provided any evidence in your report of where you conclude that it was the First Nations expectations that they would work with the highest order of government. Aside from noting the reference to Her Majesty in the treaty, can you point me to any evidence in your report to support your contention that the First Nations expectations was to deal with the Dominion rather than the province of Ontario? I did not include that evidence in this report. So this is just generally speaking then? I would put it in the category of well-known to historians who study government indigenous relationships. Thank you, but there's no evidence of that in this particular no. report. Thank you. So on slide, uh, 62, just jumping back a little bit. The fourth bullet point on that page, you tell us that after the capitalization of the annuities under award 15, the downstream responsibility for the treaty annuity payments would fall on the Dominion of Canada. Isn't it the case that the Dominion was already paying the annuities since 1867? Isn't that right? Correct. So the practical responsibility of making the payments to individuals had been the Dominion's since 1867. Correct. And the capitalization amount that arose and was dealt with in Award 15, that capitalization amount was added to the debts of Ontario and Quebec. Isn't that right? Correct. Uh, the final point, just to clarify, you say further arbitrations occurred and sought to wind up the accounts. Is it fair to say it wasn't further arbitrations, but rather further awards? Uh, correct. Right. Sorry. Professor Coates, um, the materials you have with you on the stand there, do they include your report and your slide deck? Yes. Do you have any notes on them? Yes. Would you mind if I take a look at those notes? I'm sure you won't be able to read them. Thank you very much. Justice Hennessy, uh, subject to any questions that arise from the notes of Professor Coates that I would like to review that he's had with him on the stand, those are actually all the questions that I had. So I wonder whether 
it may be early to break, but if we could just have a 10 minute break, at least that I could go over these notes to see whether I have any further questions. It, that suits me. How is the day going? Um, thank you. Um, I think w I understand we have to break at 12.55. So uh, we, I don't know that we'll be finished by one o'clock by 12.55. But um, it doesn't look like we're going to be much beyond. Um, uh, I, I probably only have half an hour. Okay, very good. And in Mr. Ramaya? Uh, Beautiful. Okay. Very good. So we'll take 10 minutes now. That sounds fine. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. All right. Let's go recess for 10 minutes. Can we see your uh... I just wanted to note for the court and Professor Coates that I'm complete. I'm I've finished my cross examination. I have no further questions. Thank you very much. And Mr. Ramai, did you have a chance to look at those notes as well? Yeah, I had a chance to look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Is it Dr. Coates or Professor Coates that you prefer? I'm comfortable with either. Okay. So, Dr. Coates, my name is Harley Schachter, and I represent some of the First Nations in this case, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I don't think I have too many, but just a, just a couple. The first point of clarification, I suppose, is uh, you did not review the instructions that Robinson received or who he received those instructions for prior to um, entering into the treaty? No. At, uh, do you have your slide deck back? I do. Okay. Uh, and, and your report back as well? I do. Okay. So could, at page 47 of your report, um, you talk about a speech that Galt gave. And I'll wait for you to get there. It's at page 47 of your report. And you, you say Galt did not mention treaty obligations in his speech and it is not clear that the politicians favoring union gave much specific thought to the financial implications of colonial treaty making. See that sentence there? I do. My only point is I'm aside from, uh, apart from, um, uh, sorry, let me put it this way. It's more fair to say that the politicians favoring union did not give any specific thought to the financial implications of colonial treaty making. Was think, that fair? I think you're probably accurate, but I use a more a bit of a qualification only because I didn't look at absolutely all the documents. But you didn't find anything that would suggest that they turned their mind to the implications of colonial treaty making, did you? No. Thank you. If you could go over to page 48, um, I have some questions about um, the United Kingdom and the Dominion of Canada. The first point, though, comes not from page 48, but I believe from your slide deck where you said the British and Canadian governments took their obligations under the Royal Proclamation and the treaties as solemn legal obligations. Yes, I think you've said that a number of times in your testimony. Use different words, but yes, and it's it, I've, I've captured the essence of it. Um, so, but you would agree with me that these solemn legal obligations were not honored. Correct. No, not not all of them were honored. Well, I mean, let's take a look at the Royal Proclamation, for example. Uh, the Royal Proclamation, and, and you would agree with me, has a provision that 
in essence is intended to say we won't use your land until you enter into a treaty is that a fair summary that was the entire purpose of it yes thank you and you are are you familiar with the incident of mike at micah bay yes and that was an incident where the anishinaabe were of this very treaty area where the robinson superior and robinson here on treaty uh, uh, beneficiaries before there was a treaty occupied a mine because the government was using their land without a treaty. Would you agree? Correct. So why do you say they considered it a solemn legal obligation if they're not honoring it? Um, you struck at one of the main issues of the whole relationship between First Nations and government. Um, they do technically see these things as very important um, and, and, a, and an obligation. Um, but they will basically only do it when pressed. If I can use other examples very quickly. Yeah, um, um, governments moved on the Rural Proclamation primarily in response to the settlement frontier, farming, um, because they cut down the trees, develop a farm, build towns, build roads, that sort of thing. Um, that was why signed in Southern Ontario and how it was implemented. They moved much more slowly. Um, in any area sort of in a northern, in a, in a non-agricultural sort of area. Um, use perhaps one example, the First Nations in what's now Northern Manitoba started asking for a treaty right shortly after the Treaty 1, Treaty 2 were signed, Treaty 3 were signed, um, and said, please come up and sign with us. And the government said, no thanks, um, because it wasn't the agricultural frontier. Um, and they didn't see immediate pressing need. So uh, that is a um, one of the ways in which these government commitments were not not honored. Okay. At page 48, at page 48, you, about in the second full paragraph, four lines from the bottom, you say, the United Kingdom and the new Dominion of Canada reflecting concerns expressed throughout the British Empire took their relationships with Indigenous people seriously. And so here I just want to ask if this is a, if, I, if, if I've got you correct on this, is there a difference when you say they took their relationships seriously, but they didn't take the, is it also fair to say they may have taken the relationship seriously but you mean to say they did not take the fulfillment of the treaty obligations seriously? I, I think that's a fair characterization. Um, at the time, um, of course, Britain's involved with Australia and involved with New Zealand at, at roughly the same uh, period of time. Um, so they were involved in different kinds of treaty making, Treaty of Waitangi in New Zealand, for yes. example. Um, and if you follow that development, they signed the agreement. It showed they took it very seriously. Then they spent 120 years not honoring it. Imagine how someone might feel after 175 years. Um, you also talk about the United Kingdom and the Dominion of Canada uh, um, taking the relationship seriously, but you don't mention anything about the government of Ontario. And is, was that on purpose? Yes. So is it your suggestion or is it your evidence or is it your opinion, I might more accurately, that the government of Ontario did not consider the relationship with the Anishinaabe people a serious one? So it's more my opinion based on a much broader sort of well, experience with this. The answer is yes. They, they, they would deal with First Nations people when there was an issue, um, whether it was you know fishing related or hunting related or something like that but it was not a central part of their government and administration. And this is the province of Ontario. Province of Ontario. And I might add the other provinces as well. What about, uh, this is the province of uh, uh, Ontario. What about the province of Canada? Are you able to opine on that? How well, they, whether they took it seriously? Um, cognizant of time. Um, oh, don't. No, no, don't <laughs> well, just don't. in the sense, I'm, I, I talk too much. So, no, no, so um, the, the short the short answer is is that when they were the United Province of the Canadas, they had took on a lot of the administrative responsibilities of the colonial office, and a lot of those 
up after 1867, a lot of those obligations passed back to the government of Canada, right? So that is, that's how it worked out. So in that period before 1867, as they took on control of Aboriginal affairs, um, they responded to them. Did they do it well? Um, did they do it systematically? Um, there's a whole series of scandals. There's a whole series of, of problems and issues during the UPC period where First Nations were, were far from happy uh, with the developments that were actually taking place. And that was the case in British Columbia. It was the case in the Maritimes. It was the nature of the colonial system. But would you characterize the uh, feelings of the province of Canada administration as one as considering the treaty obligation, sorry, the treaty relate treaty relationship with indigenous period peoples in a serious manner? I would kind of describe it the way you talked about before that in fact, it was conceptually seen as a as an ongoing obligation as a legal obligation and as a moral obligation. Administratively and financially, they were much more reluctant. And the bottom of page 48, your, the first sentence reads, as the practical realities of confederation unfolded, indigenous issues generally and treaty responsibilities specifically were rarely top of mind for successive federal governments. Now, I'm gonna to suggest to you that they were never top of mind for successive federal governments that I'm aware of. So there'd be a couple of qualifications on that. Um, after sort of establishment of Manitoba and Red River and the issues came up around the prairies um, and the settlement of the prairies, um, they were actually a, a fairly important sort of issue. Johnny McDonald um, had responsibility himself, even as prime minister of responsibility for Indian affairs at that time. Um, and he, it was a quick main issue that I would describe in this way. Um, South of the border at the same time, there were wars raging between indigenous people and the government of the United States. And there was great concern that those conflicts would spill over into Canada. Um, and so there was a concern um, to deal with treaties, to sign the treaties in the first case, that got a fair amount of attention, um, and then to manage them subsequently. So, you're, so when you say that um, treaty responsibilities became top of mind, you mean the entering into the treaties became top of mind post-Confederation, is that what you mean? Yes. Thank you. Um, what, would you agree with me that there's no evidence that the implementation of the Robinson Superior Treaty or the Robinson Huron Treaty was ever top of mind for any government at all? And did not show up prominently at all. Pardon me? Did not show up prominently at all for either the federal or provincial governments. Did you find any evidence that it showed up prominently or, or in any prominent manner at all for the province of Canada? Um, not so much for the province of Canada for the simple reason that by 1841, um, a lot of the relationships had started to change and the First Nations in the southern areas um, were going through some considerable difficulties. But there were examples where um, Six Nations, for instance, where they were fairly heavily involved. This is the Haldeman track and the selling of those lands and things like that, that they were, they got a fair amount of political attention. I, I, I asked about Robinson. Oh, you're sorry. Treaty. I'm sorry. My apologies. No, I would agree with your key statement. Thank you. And to be clear, the key statement is the province of Canada did not um, consider or did not uh, have in their mind uh, the interests of the of honoring sorry did not have in their mind the rob the implementation of the robinson superior treaties anywhere near the top of their mind if that's a question that you can answer it was not a high priority all right so it was it a low priority do you see evidence that they even turned their mind to it not systematically. What tends to happen, if you don't mind me expanding a little bit, Robinson is a good example of this, um, is that there was an interest in clearing the responsibility. So they have an obligation to sign treaties where a proclamation responsibility, so they signed the treaties. 
Um, once they're signed, they meet the obligations under annuities. Those things are done relatively systematically. Um, and then when conflicts arose or when opportunities or issues arose, they would turn their attentions to it. But this was not something that was a central part of government planning. Do you see any evidence? There's no evidence in the record, I would suggest to you, that the administration um, of the province of Canada prior to Confederation turned its mind to how to implement the annuity augmentation provisions. I've not seen any. Thank you. Could you please turn to um, let's see. Uh, page 93 of your report. Page 93 of your report contains a number of final comments. Um, you opine in the very first sentence that the specific and general characteristics of the Indigenous government relationship is, in my opinion, one of the most important elements in this discussion. You see right. that? Yes. And the discussion you're referring there to is what? The unfolding of um, formal relationships between um, the government of Canada, the provinces, and Indigenous, indigenous peoples. Um, and the relationship of indigenous peoples to sort of the new, um, the new economy, a new society of a, of, a, of a brand new country. Okay, so it, when you're talking about the discussion, you're not talking about uh, the um, arbitrations and the allocation of debt, are you? I always was trying throughout this whole process to put those processes, the arbitration processes and debt issues in that broader context of federal indigenous and or government indigenous relations. So the um, the indigenous government indigenous government relationship uh, did not find its way into the uh, confederation discussions at all. No, no not you. in any substantial way. Now, I take it you did not interview any of the Anishinaabe people to see what their views are of the relationship with the Crown and whether it's symbolic or substantive? I did not. In fact, your comments about the symbolic importance of the treaties is really a general statement uh, of the post-confederation world and mostly the prairie provinces. Is that correct? Um, broader than the prairie provinces, but yes, it's mostly the post-confederation world. Would you agree with me that the BNA Act um, does not speak to which crown is responsible to fulfill treaty terms? It does not do that. Um, I want you to assume for, with me for a moment a hypothetical that notwithstanding what the BNA Act says, that Ontario must exercise its powers under the Constitution Act in conformity with the honor of the Crown, and that when any government, be it federal dominion or provincial, like Ontario, exercises Crown power, the exercise of that power is burdened by the Crown obligations under the treaty to the Anishinaabe. So I'm asking you to assume that that is, Yana, is, is the case. Mr. Ramai is a... Yes, Yana. My friend is asking the witness to answer a legal question. I haven't asked the question yet. No, I, I haven't heard the question. A hypothetical legal question. No, he said assume this hypothetical. That There's no question flowing from that yet. All right, I'll wait for that. Thank you. So do you understand the hypothetical I'm putting to you, yes. a, a set of responsibilities that Ontario has? Yes. And if that is a correct statement of Ontario's obligations, my question to you is, are you able to tell the court how your opinion 
in your report might change, if at all, in respect of the issue of the adjustment of debts and liabilities under 111 and 112? I would, I would have difficulty doing that, to be honest, um, because, you know, the hypothetical sort of draws in a lot of contemporary law, um, the re-empowerment of Indigenous peoples, the new relationships, new concepts of the honour of the crown that didn't exist in, in, the, in sort of the political realm um, uh, all, the, all the way through. Um, they were, we talked about the fact that these issues were, were not front of mind uh, before. Um, and so you've asked me to sort of take a, a fairly strong description of the contemporary cir circumstances and apply it back at that time. And yeah. as an historian, I, I don't really like to do that because that was not how people thought. But I can tell you how they thought. So um, the, um, we can say then that your opinion wouldn't change because you're of the view that Ontario people did not have the view that they had this crown obligation that I assumed. Yeah, I, I think I'm understanding you correct, correctly. And I, I think I would agree that, that at the time, they did not have that comprehensive sense. Um, at, as a, governments, they had responsibilities under treaties, under royal proclamation. The population at large had not internalized these at all. A couple more questions and then we're done. We're uh, easy on time. Yeah. Do you agree in a, uh, with me that the Robinson Superior Treaty is a treaty by which the Crown and the Anishinaabe would share in the future potential of the treaty territory? Um, because of the augmentation clause, that is, is a, a very clear understanding. Thank you. Do you agree with me that there is no limit on the treaty annuity? There were no, there was, it was set up in such a way that it could be augmented if resources were developed in such a way. So your bullet point at, at page 49 of your slide deck. I want to look at the third bullet point. The last sentence of the third bullet point says, the treaties negotiated also sought to establish limits on government financial responsibilities to the First Nations. You see that sentence there? Yes. That's not true with respect to the Robinson treaties. Would you agree with me? I would agree with you, and but also point out that they did not use that same clause in subsequent treaties. Uh, yes. Can you go to slide deck 51, please? Slide deck 51 is about in Indian affairs prior to Confederation. And you make the point that by 1860, the British government had transferred responsibility to the colonial authorities, correct? Correct. And now we know, as a historian, you know that that process didn't just automatically happened in 1860, but it, there was a gradual um, assumption of responsibility for Indian affairs by the colonial authorities starting, I would say, about 1830. Might that be fair? Correct. That's about the rough time. Yep. So what happened around 1830? Um, the main issue that happens is the transference away from the the nation to nation kind of concept you had around the, the military agreements with and, and the alliances with First Nations people. And the government starts, governments of Upper Canada and the governments of Britain start getting concerned about the socioeconomic cultural transformation, what I described earlier as sort of civilization, 
uh, and, uh, assimilation and protection, that kind of thing. So you get a gradual sort of taking over of those responsibilities. Um, the other thing that happens, of course, is the population of UPC surges. And you now have a much, much larger population. And UPC is focused on the needs and, and um, demands of the non-Indigenous population. The indigenous folks get politically marginalized. I, I, I want to sort of further the conversation about your comments about the move away from a nation to nation uh, relationship. Now, I understood that um, your comment was intended to reflect that the Imperial Crown no longer needed the First Nations militarily, correct? Correct. That's what you meant by nation to nation. Uh, precisely. But in 1850, when the treaty was made for the raw in the Robinson treaties, it was still a nation to nation treaty, correct? That's how treaties were set up, correct. Okay. I think this would be a good time to break. I have a little bit more, but I won't be finished by All right. 1255. Thank you. Um, we do not have a lot, I believe, for this witness, but we then do have the document issue to deal with in the afternoon. And so um, I don't know. Um, Ms. Lewis is suggesting that two o'clock would be good and a short break. I think people want to get to Toronto. Center of the universe. <laughs> um, I, that works. Two o'clock. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Oh,